Now, it's not how to avoid failures, but uh, um, is, this is, was for me also how to, to learn what are actually the key factors which may predict my failure. So if you're in this situation, you did a fracture surgery and this ends up like this, you ask why does it fail? Or why did it fail? What are the reasons? So first we have uh, patient-related factors. Second, we have fracture type related factors. And we have also surgery related factors. Patient related factors is very easy to define its age. It's not only the problem of the patient, it's all our problem. We are aging. So if you go back to Letonel and Jude to the book, for him, osteopenia and old age were rather a contraindication for fixation, stabilization of an acetabular fracture. But can this still be true today, 2011? If you look at Joel Matter's data, you see patients over 60 years of age have increased from the first period, 1980 to 93, from 10% to 24% in a more recent period, 94, 2007. That means an incre a 2.4-fold increase in old patients treated for acetabular fractures. If you look uh, at the data from the German pelvic study group, uh, Dr. Kuhlmann was uh, so nice to give me this data, you see there are two peaks for pelvic and acetabular fracture. You can even say three peaks. They're a very young group, 20 years of age, maybe around 50, but the highest peak is actually around 80, 85. So if you Take this last group, 50% of the patients treated for acetabular pelvic fractures are 70 years or older nowadays. So this is reality today. God bless you. <laughs> so there's also probably some, with aging, there's also probably some change in mechanism of injury. If I go, went, go, went back in history on the books, I found actually literature from Hippocrates who was talking about how you could create anterior hip dislocation with a hip locking technique in wrestlers. Homer also described another mechanism, a blow from a stone on the thigh to create an acetabular fracture. So thank God activities have changed over time, but you still see the very old, very active people may put but very much load on the hip joint. So this is a 100-year-old British citizen, actually from India originally, who finished his marathon. I think he was only six hours later. It came in six hours later than the first one, but he's still much better than me. <laughs> so activities have changed. And this, you can also see the mechanism, this will also influence or has influenced the mechanism of injuries. If you go back to Joel's data, the fall is the predominant cause in older ones, a simple fall. It may be at home in the bathroom, it may be on Jakobsholm while skiing, nearly 50%. Still one third of the old guys, I would say, who with an acetabular fracture are riding a motorcycle. But this is clearly less than a young population, we are two thirds are, um, no, sorry, but it's not a motorcycle, it's a motor vehicle accident, but in the young population, it's about two thirds motor vehicle accidents. So one problem is age. The other problem or key factor are related to fracture type and specifically fracture patterns. You may have very, or these are the very poor predictors are anterior dislocation, an anterior wall fracture, posterior wall involvement. Anterior dislocation, fortunately, is rare. Anterior wall fracture, however, is increasing nowadays. And posterior wall, wall involvement is very frequent. We heard this is even 50% or more of all fractures. It's not a posterior wall fracture per se, it's just involvement. It can be any type combined with the posterior wall involvement. 
And if you look at Lutonet's data, the posterior wall and posterior column fracture had the worst outcome. Also, very rather poor outcome, transverse and posterior wall, 48%. Posterior wall is the intermediate outcome, 72 but this comprises all posterior wall fractures. And if you go to comminuted or impacted posterior wall fractures, your favorable clinical outcome rate will come down. So posterior wall, per se, is an important negative predictor. This is a situation we know. It's a transverse and posterior wall fracture, but it's not only transverse and posterior wall, it's a comminuted posterior wall. You can see at least two fragments here on this x-ray, so rather difficult to get a good result in this patient. Again, from a German pelvic study group, they also looked which types of fractures have increased in the last decades, and you can clearly see that the the anterior column, hemitransverse increased, the anterior column has increased, and as I said before, also the anterior wall fracture have increased over time. So though they are becoming more frequent now, with the anterior column being the most frequent fracture. This has also his input in the surgical approaches. Again, from the same study group, they had th they looked through over three periods, starting in 91 until 2006. And the blue line down here, that's the oldest period starting in 91. You see in the oldest period, the cochlear langenbeck approach was used in about 65%, and the iliac inguinal in about 12%. Now, if you look at the most recent period, which is the yellow bar, you see the cochlear langenbeck has decreased to 35%, and iliac inguinal approach has taken over uh, 45% more frequent. So this is reflecting the different, the changing frequency of fracture types we see. So anterior dislocation, anterior wall fracture, posterior wall involvement, we heard. It's also, there are also features like impaction, maybe of the dome or posterior wall fragments, impaction also of the head, and initial displacement of more than 20 millimeters. If you look again at the data from Joel Mato, you see also here in his data, in the patients over 60 years, there was a significant mm -hmm. higher frequency of anterior column fracture. So this goes along with the data from the German study group. Everybody experiences this, at least in the United States and in Europe. But also he found quite a lot of co other components, extra components, a separate quadrilateral plate component in 50%, dome impaction, as we've seen before, maybe described by a gull sign, or you see it better with CT, 40%, communication posterior wall, which is not a good sign, 44%, impaction in posterior wall fractures, also close to 40%. So rather, free, rather high rate of additional patterns um, to our as a tabular fracture types in the patients over 60 years. Dome impaction, you can see here, you can really estimate it with a nice views on the CT scan. You see also the injury to the femoral head on the left side. You see a fragment of the femoral head on the right side. And you see impaction of the posterior wall. <clears throat> Again, with AP view, you see displacement Medially, you see an extra a separation, a fragmentation of the quadrilateral blade. It's not only one piece anymore attached with the posterior column. It's multi-fragmentary. You see a severe impaction of the dome up here. And you also see, like here, you also see a severe damage of the femoral head. It's an impaction of the femoral head. So these factors are becoming much more important <laughs> for our prediction in future. Again, on the other side, the quadrilateral surface, which is frequently out in this old patients and anterior column fractures, severe damage to the femoral head over here, and impaction of the posterior superior dome. Now that's a typical case. We see very frequent, in nearly every second case, 70-year-old men, old patients, after fall, impaction of the acetabular, uh, of acetabular dome, anterior column fractures, fractures of the quadrilateral plate. 
This is the reduction here. The anatomic reduction here has been achieved, to my opinion, but you still are left with the problems of a femoral head injury or impacted fragments which may secondarily displace. Femoral head lesions, I mentioned, they can be very severe and look like this, like abrasion lesions, and you can, whatever you do for your reduction of the acetabulum, this may, or this is very likely to fail with the head like this. It just won't work. Surgery-related factors, we now delayed surgery more than 21 days. I would even say more than two weeks is bad, and we try to avoid it whenever we can. Sometimes you can, but I strive to do for, forward to do this uh, fractures very early to get a better result. And last but not least, it's our result of our work of the surgery-related surgery and surgeons experience related non anatomical reduction or a to end or an incongruent joint or dome. This is a situation like before, difficult fracture with impaction also here, reduction, and we have seen this case before, there is a, a still impacted dome fragment here, and you can predict this, this fracture will fail rather easy and early. non anatomical reduction, these are the um, the four most frequent fracture types we don't get non-anatomical reductions. Anterior wall, we know that has a poor prognosis, but there's also anterior column, posterior hemitransfers of both columns. They don't have necessarily a very good reduction in very much cases, so in one third they don't have an anatomical reduction, but they still do rather well. The T-shaped fracture, non-anatomical reduction, 30% in the though they just do fairly. There are only two fracture types which have a spe specific prediction for outcome. We know that anterior wall fractures, like you see here from the data from Moritz Tanners, the anterior wall fractures fail rather early and they have a very poor prognosis. And in contrast, although not, you don't get an anatomical reduction in, in all of the cases, the both columns still do better than the other ones. But this means only two out of ten fracture types have a predictive, uh, uh, are predictive. So you don't have the, the fracture types in the other eight fractures will not give you a prediction for outcome. That means we have to look for these factors, not for the fracture type, apart from these two mentioned fractures. We have to look much more to these factors. They will tell us how the patient will do. So the worst or the, the highest hazard rate you have is an anterior dislocation of the head. Fortunately, this is rare. But second highest hazard rate, you will have with age, femoral head cartilage lesion, and surgery-related components, which is non-anatomical reduction and incongruency of the roof. So what about age? The Bernie's Hip Research Group is hardly working on this sol solution of the problem. We are looking for the fountain of Yauf. Try to make old people young, so we will have better results. Unfortunately, we have not succeeded so far, and you all know reality is different. Life is different. Aging is nothing for whims and softies. Femoral head cartilage lesion. We have no solution to that so far. What about non-anatomic reduction, incongruence with the roof? That's something we can work on us. And this is uh, advertising, of course, for our course. This is why we're all here. We have to train and to understand why we fail, why the, our surgery fails, and how to become better. To just uh, to end, Moritz Tanners and a fellow of us, George Warp, have uh, created some of the joint survival database just to put all this together, which I told you now. And uh, I will show you an example how this could work in the future. No? We have a 50-year-old male. I've showed you the case, transverse posterior wall fracture. Um, there is a posterior dislocation of the femoral head, a large femoral head cartilage lesion, which we can see on CT scan, and this patient underwent 
open reduction internal fixation. So how will he do? If you go to the key factors, H is set, it's 50, anterior dislocation, no. Posterior wall involvement, yes. Displacement was high initially, more than two centimeters. He had a femoral head lesion. The joint was congruent, or let's say it becomes congruent. We are doing a good job. We have an anatomic reduction. So we see his prognosis will be, if you go, for example, to the 15-year uh, level, you get, will be around 60% that he has a successful, or still a maintained hip joint. If you're not as good and we don't get an anatomic reduction here and we put a no, how will this change his prognosis? So this was the initial case with a perfect reduction. If reduction is imperfect, his rate will drop down to 20%, his survival change to 20% at 15 years. Some things we can't change. And for example, we can change that he had a femoral head lesion. But if he would be able to change this and he would not have had a femoral head lesion, how is his outcome then? Again, this is the ori original case. So without a femoral head lesion, his prognosis dramatically becomes better. And he will have 80% uh, prognosis of survival at 80 years. Now, let's say he's not 50. We, we have found the fountain of Yauf and he's 20 years of age with the same features we had before and an anatomic reduction, his prognosis will increase from 60 also to 80%, dramatically increase. Last not least, let's be mean and we let just age the patient and say he's 80 now. See again, that's our original, original prognosis, so if 80, it drops severely. So age is a very important factor which you can't influence. So in summary, older age and the associated osteopenia are strong, negative predictive factors. Fracture types are less predictive for outcome, except until a wall that's poor, both column generally favorable. Specific fracture patterns have been our mind, which judge and which help us judgment of the prognosis. Involvement of posterior wall is a bad sign, impaction is a bad thing to have comminution, initial displacement, more than 20 millimeters, and femoral head lesions. Thank you very much.